and welcome to the very first wing kit video. The format might be changing a little bit. I'm going to go over that here in the beginning, but also make sure to stick around till the end because we're going to have a very appropriate giveaway for this first video covering the wing spars. <laughs> All right, so the reason the format might change here just a little bit is as you're gonna see with the wings, a lot of the components can be built separately. So you're not adding one thing to the other, um, you're doing where you, know, you can build this part here and then this part here and this part here, and then you attach it all. And because of that, that afforded us the opportunity with two of us building to have one person work on one thing and one person work on another. So. While I'm about to start working here on the wing spars, Tyler ends up working on the fuel tanks. And I have to figure out now how's the best way to try to go over this of, do I just do the wing spars and then go back in and cover the fuel tanks? Or do I try to talk to you guys about what we're doing simultaneously? I'm not sure, this is very different. So we're gonna play it by ear. And the big thing is for y'all to leave me some comments down below to let me know if something doesn't make sense or you don't like how it's being changed or presented. I don't know, basically if you have input, let me know down below because this is a whole new ball of wax. I think the other good thing to mention here at the beginning is that there's discussion about whether or not you should do one wing in its entirety and then the other or do both wings simultaneously. And so for us personally, what we decided to do is to work on both simultaneously. That once we got into a rhythm doing one of these tasks on one of these parts, not wanting to then set it aside and then come back to the opposite one, you know, weeks or months later and try and remember, well, wait a minute, what was it we were doing? Um, we just decided we wanted to do both at the same time. So that's what you're gonna see. There should be, in most of these videos, like four different parts that are out at the same time where you're gonna see I have the left and right of one thing and Tyler has the left and right of another out. And if I was to do it again, I would do it exactly the same way. I think it was just really helpful to just be able to go and do the exact same process on both at the same time and just get it done and not have to worry about moving on. Now we were lucky again that we have the space here in the garage to be able to have both of the spars out at once and the other parts out at the same time. If you have a space restriction, obviously that could come into play, but for us, that wasn't an issue. And if I was to go back and do it again, I'd do the same thing and just do both wings together at the same time. That just worked really well. All right, starting off with the wing spars, that was day 91 to 109 and then days 117 to 119. I will say this, I think the wing spars were the part that made me the most nervous and that is because, as you noticed, if you've received yours already, you got both wing spars and both center spar sections at the same time. They're a matched set. If you look at the ends, they're engraved with matching numbers showing that these four all belong together as a set. And I had called Vans a while back out of curiosity just at how much these cost. And at the time, which was before all the price increases, it was like $2,500 for each wing spar. And then I think like $1,500 for each center spar. So now if you're having to order all uh, four of them again, I think it, that it came out to basically about like $8,000. <laughs> And my understanding is if you mess up one, you have to get a whole new set that the, the whole thing is they're all matched to each other. The holes are all matched to each other where the wings attach to the center spars. So if one goes bad, my understanding is you have to get all four. So the idea of having to order $8,000 worth of parts again, and then shipping these, because of course these are very long and very heavy. I was just really worried about not wanting to <laughs> screw up. So it talks about here in the very first step about making sure you know, you know, uh, upper and lower flange and where, which is aft and forward and inside and outside. And so I just made sure to go ahead and mark everything really well and really big here with this permanent marker to make sure that there was no mistakes between which one's left, which one's right, which way it's facing, um, just while we're getting started. 
Another thing I think worth pointing out here in the beginning is how you can see that the spars are longer than the width of our table. And it mentions later on in 13-2 um, step seven about supporting the spar in the middle and at the tip end uh, as required to keep the spar straight. You don't wanna have it sag um, just with its own weight there. It, it will end up sagging if it's not supported. So we ended up getting out sawhorses to help support whichever end was hanging off the end of the table there so that we did keep it straight and then like it says you can use the wood blocks to support it in the middle and at the tip end this also uh, I we felt keep in handy because of those step bars that are on the forward side there that are uh, makes it a little bit uneven putting the wood blocks there under that side kind of helped us really to keep it straight because now there was no chance of it being a little bit twisted in the front if you had a little two by four piece that went between this the uh, the two step bars there at the inboard end. While you're working on it, uh, if the forward side with those step bars is face down. I let this to sink in. We're about to start the wings. I know, pretty awesome. <laughs> or I could do a proceed. <laughs> So the very first thing you end up doing is actually extending the length of the spars by adding the spar web extensions with the spar sp splice plates. Uh, and I want to say, I'm not sure if it was in here in these instructions or somewhere else. I think so. These are actually the spars that the RV14 uses, but then because you're doing the 10 and it's got the different uh, specs and everything, you need to end up actually elongating the spars. So that's why you're adding these bits here. Pretty self-explanatory. And again, like it says, make sure to label everything really well because those four different um, splice plates are exactly identical. And you want to make sure that you line up the right ones with the right ones when you're trying to rivet it all back together again. After that, you're going to go ahead and make these wing box J sniffers. And so this is the part where, again, I realized that the eight foot J channels aren't eight feet. <laughs> and realize the problem we had with the tail cone that I've already shown you how we fixed. So just make sure to keep that in mind when you're measuring everything for step five. Eight foot J channels aren't eight feet. They're a half inch short from eight feet long. So make sure that you measure it the full length of 92 and a quarter inches like it tells you to do in step five. But here in step seven, this is what I briefly mentioned earlier with the two step bars that are on the forward side of the spar. You now need to have that forward side down because you're lining up these J stiffeners with the flanges of the spar to do some match drilling into them. And now you have that uneven forward side of the spar that you're having to lay flat on the table. So again, wood blocks there under the center like it talks about. Um, if you have have other little smaller ones if you're having any instability they put under the little bits of the steps bottom line like it says wood blocks work to help just keep it straight and level so just like it says there in step seven we use the clico clamps to hold those g channels to the flanges there of the spar I try to space those out pretty evenly along the lengths of the full J stiffeners. And then do make sure to note that in step seven, it says there in the last line that the uh, long J stiffeners should be clamped first, followed by the short J stiffeners, which then nest inside of the long J stiffeners. The other thing too to note is that it does say that in step eight that you are not supposed to match drill the lower wing box J stiffeners in three different areas in the lower spar flange. And then it lists two different figures, the one on that page, figure two, and then page 13-5, figure two. Honestly, the second one I think is a, a more, makes it more clear like which ones that you're not supposed to do. And then I just made sure to write on the flange, no, <laughs> so that I didn't accidentally go and match drill those. While I am sitting here drilling through low so many holes on both flanges of both spars, I'm going to take this opportunity quickly to please remind you to like the video if you do, subscribe to my channel if you haven't already done so, and if you are planning to buy any model of Vans aircraft, would you please consider going to plainlady.com slash referral, downloading that referral form, filling in your information, and sending it to Vans when you receive your empanage kit for any model of Vans aircraft. Vans will send me $100 as 
as a thank you. It doesn't cost you anything extra, but it is a really great way to help support the channel and let me know that you guys appreciate and enjoy the videos out there. In fact, if you have sent one to Van since January of last year, January 2021, would you mind sending me a quick email at christine at plainlady.com? Thanks so much. All right, so let's get back to the bill. <laughs> The next step here is where, for me personally, it started to get a little bit confusing. And I don't know, again, maybe it's just me. Like I've mentioned several times, I'm a much more visual person. Um, like seeing things goes a long way for me to better understand. But we'll see. Let's see what you guys think. On 13-3, step two, it says to machine countersink the nut plate attach rivet holes in the flanges of the spar assembly. That's no big deal. We've done that before countless places in the build so far. You're countersinking to uh, have the nut plate attached rivet holes there. No big deal. The next part, though, it says to machine countersink those rib to spar flange attached rivet holes that are in line with the nut plate attached rivet holes and are inboard of the most outboard fuel tank attached nut plate. <laughs> so now... That makes perfect sense to me. I totally understand it. At the time, I was like, what are you talking about? Like, I I was just super confused. I'm like, wait, what? Which, which ones am I lining up? I think possibly part of it is, like, on, on these pages here, you've got the isometric drawings. So that's the ones where you've got it here, like, at the angle that you're looking at. And... It's a little more difficult, I think, because of the sheer number of holes. I mean, if you're looking here on figure one on 13-3, I mean, look how many lines and rivets and everything. It's it's a little overwhelming, possibly, just because, again, we've just started this. We've just started the wing spars. Like I said, I was already nervous about don't screw up because you don't want to have to replace them. But if you flip ahead instead to 13-5 figure two, you can see they have like a, a flattened orthographic view of the wing spar. So it's that head on perspective and they've like flattened out the flanges so that you can really clearly, more clearly in my opinion, kind of like see the holes and see how they line up. The other thing I think that, that maybe helps make some of the different instructions make a little bit more sense is that if you take the time to really figure out uh, how everything actually attaches to the spars. I went and flipped ahead and looked at some of the other different sections to try to see where everything went because again, being more visual, if, okay, if I can understand where everything goes, maybe this is gonna help make better sense to me what it's trying to ask me to do. So to kind of quickly explain a little bit to to kind of get to where it helped make it make sense for me i'm going to try and see if maybe it helps make sense for any of you out there who had the same like confused look on your face when you read this step the so on the spars on the forward side of the spars you have the fuel tanks on the inboard side and then on the outboard side you have the leading edges the leading edges get permanently riveted on. The fuel tanks get attached with screws into those nut plates like it's talking about for the fuel tank attached. On the aft side of those uh, wing spars, you have wing ribs that get attached all the way down. And then you have the top skins and the bottom skins. And then on the bottom side, there's also these access panels that get attached. The skins get riveted on except for obviously where you have the attached panels that go in on the bottom so what it's trying to tell you here if you're looking at 13-5 figure two 
You can see the doubler that we talked about earlier that's on the aft side there of the spar. And you can see where there's, I don't know, where the doubler like bridges the get, the span of the web there. And you can see there's one, two, three, four, five holes that go in each of those little spans. That's where the wing ribs go. And so if you look just above and just below where it's got the flanges flattened out, you can see there's two holes on each flange on the top and the bottom. Those connect to the wing ribs. The forward most of those two holes is what you're countersinking here in this step. You're countersinking it because you need to rivet those wing ribs to the spar and you need to put a rivet through that spar flange into those wing ribs. But because those fuel tanks are gonna have the skins sit on top and then get screwed into the nut plates, those rivets, the you need to have it countersunk to receive the countersunk rivet for those forwardmost of the two holes going into the wing rib. Hopefully that makes sense. So then it's, so then with the rivet that goes in there is flush to the flange, the spar flange, and now it won't interfere when you try to attach the fuel tank to uh, the front end there of the, the forward end of the spar. The aft hole is different because the aft hole is going to be receiving the dimpled skin, the dimpled top skin and the dimpled bottom skin that is going to sit on that aft side there of the spar like I was talking about earlier. So that one's going to end up getting countersunk with the rest of them later to receive the dimpled skin. So that's why on these, uh, let's see, wing rib to spar flange attach holes, I think that's what it called them. Let me go back and read it in the instruction. Yeah, the rib to spar flange attach rivet holes. Um, that's why those forward ones need to be countersunk to receive the countersunk rivet. And then those aft ones get countersunk to receive the dimpled skin because that those forward holes line up with where the fuel tank attaches and the fuel tank's gonna sit there. So there is gonna be no rivet going through that fuel tank skin. Those only get attached, the fuel tanks only get attached with the screws, but those aft holes are all gonna be countersunk for the dimpled skin because that's where the top skins and bottom skins are gonna get riveted on. Hopefully that makes sense now kind of like looking at it a different way. Again, to some of you, you might have read that first instruction. It's like, oh, okay, I get it. I, I, I am just very visual. I need to like see it and kind of understand it. And again, flipping through, flipping ahead to understand like how everything attached really seemed to help me personally. Um, but that's what it's trying to tell you to do there. So if you're like, huh, go look at the, do the drawing there on 13-5. Uh, figure two and flip ahead if you're still confused to try and see okay wait a minute how's everything attaching and see then if it helps make better sense but those are the holes it's trying to tell you to do and that's why you're doing it just deep enough to get the head of the 4263 rivet yeah okay and now here in step three this is this is again like i was just saying where it's telling you that you're now going to be countersinking uh deep enough to fit the dimples of the wing skin so again this is where on those aft holes you're dimpling for those uh, top skins to go in, uh, keeping in mind, again, this is um, 0.032 inch thick aluminum. And so these are the ones where you're now dimpling to receive, sorry, you're countersinking to receive the dimpled skin, not just the countersunk rivet. I called this part of the uh, <laughs> the build here, I called this countersinking hell. And like half jokingly, but half seriously, um, just because, well, here, you can hear what I said the day off. How's it going?
Again, you know, like it's it's nothing bad, it's nothing hard. It's just it definitely got very repetitive and monotonous. And like I mentioned, is like I didn't feel like I had a lot of progress to show for like what I had just been doing. I, I wrote down somewhere I think in the instructions that there was like 490 holes. So I don't know if that is per spar or were both spars. I mean, I would believe either one because there was just so many. Um, but, you know, just put on some good music and just get into the groove. But make sure you've got everything, like, marked really well so you don't actually get into, like, too much of a groove and not, um, like, end up accidentally maybe counter seeking somebody the wrong way. So make sure everything's really labeled, but just, you know, gear up for it and knock it out and then it's over. <laughs> it's all done. Uh, so the next part here, you're now going to be doing the countersinking for the access panels and then for the fuel tanks to get screwed in. And you'll notice it has you riveting the nut plates in. Like it says in the instructions there, the whole reason it's got you riveting these nut plates on first is because the screw hole in the nut plate is what's going to end up holding that pilot there on the countersink cutters in place as you countersink it. So when you go to countersink, it's going to end up uh, opening up that hole enough that there'd be nothing left in the spar flange to guide that pilot of the countersink cutter. So you need that nut plate back there so that now the little pilot uh, tip on those countersink cutters is guided by the hole in the nut plate. Um, and then I did not want to test this with the spar flange and risk messing anything up. So I found a scrap piece of very thick aluminum angle that we had and um, used that to set the depth of the um, microstop for the countersink cutter um, and used the same little uh, like test piece of the dimpled skin like it describes making there in figure two and figure four. But I just didn't want to test it on the spar flange, so I just, again, used some very thick um, aluminum angle to make the holes and countersink, like set the countersink using that instead. A couple little things I might point out here. One is just to be aware that uh, it calls for in the instructions you're putting in K1100-08 nut plates. There are also K1000-08 nut plates. So just keep that in mind like when you're looking on your inventory or grabbing the bags or whatever. Um, with the, the numbering being so similar, it might be easy to overlook that. But the thing is, if you use the wrong ones, you'll know because the K1000-08 eight nut plates don't have that little recessed part there for the uh the screw to end up sitting in for the the fuel tanks so if you put the wrong ones on you'll know right away it won't countersink properly um but just to keep in mind i guess even throughout the build there's the k1000-08 and k1100-08 so just make sure you're grabbing the right bag you can see here we even made sure to write on them uh just so that we don't end up reading too quickly and then oh oops i grabbed the wrong one <laughs> the other thing is just uh bull lube is definitely your friend at this point with all of the countersinking there um if i forgot to put any on there my countersink cutter would just make this awful screeching noise because i think you're just cutting away so much metal get out your bull lube and use that there on the uh on the spar flanges when you're doing all the countersinking moving on now to 13-4, let's see here, in step two, where it says to run a number 30 drill through the three spar doubler to spar web ribbit holes that you see in figure one, go look there where it says the AN426AD4-6, since those are the ones that would need number 30. Those are the three there that it's talking about that you're going to countersink uh, on the aft side for those three rivets. 
Uh, in step three here, okay, now you're going to be machine countersinking for the nut plate attached rivet holes, and it mentions about how the countersinks for the fuel tank attached nut plate rivet holes are on the forward side of the spar assembly. So these nut plates are going to be on the aft side there. You can see in figure one, fuel tank attached nut plates. The nut plates go on the aft side. The countersinking is done on the forward side. And as you can see here in this picture, these... Um, the bars I mentioned earlier, those are the step bars. Those are in the way of the micro stop there for our countersink. Now, there may be another tool out there that I'm not familiar with to help you get into a tight spot like this. But when we called our tech advisor, because we went, uh, what do we do? The suggestion that was made to us is to take the tool that you use to deburr the holes normally, and you use that to slowly by hand countersink the hole. So uh, when you're learning to deburr, you know, you, you, you try, don't over deburr the holes because you're not trying to countersink them. Well, this is the one time when you're going to not listen to that and you're, you're trying to actually countersink the hole using the deburring tip. So whatever it is that you use to deburr the holes, that's what you're going to end up using to slowly countersink uh, these two holes here where you can't get the the micro stop to fit there's the two spots there you can see so one against that uh, upper step bar and one against that lower step bar where you're going to have to go in by hand and do that uh, just because you can't get the the little micro stop there for the countersink cutter to fit so go slow be patient uh, and just go and do a little at a time and then test it until you get it to be just right for uh, sitting the rivet in there and having it countersunk just right also then, when it came to riveting them, because of the location of those two in particular um, rivets there with the step bar being where it was, uh, instead of trying to get the mushroom set to fit in there, which we weren't sure it would really fit very well, uh, we just ended up back riveting those uh, and sticking the bucking bar up against the... Um, manufactured head of the rivet instead and then just back riveting from the back <laughs> oh and now we're back to tapping and uh i think i already went over when i did the one for the tail and tried to tap that the first time um <laughs> that i did not use the tap properly uh if you haven't seen that or if i didn't go into it enough um, remember that like you, you tap, there's lots of YouTube videos about this. So I'm not going to go into like making a video about it, but go find one of those, but you go like a little tap it a little bit, then back it off, then go a little more, then back it off. And you know, it's, it's kind of like a two steps forward, one step back sort of approach. Don't just try to tap the whole thing at once. Trust me, that doesn't work, <laughs> but you're going an inch deep. So, uh, if if you have nothing else to help you like determine how far you're supposed to go, easy way to do this is to measure an inch on the tap there and then just put something like painter's tape at the far end to indicate when you've gotten the tap in far enough. Like that's a, an easy way to measure out where an inch stops on the tap and then just put a little like blue painter's tape on the end of it so you know when to stop. On to step seven here. Uh, I just used a little wood block to help me clamp the tie down bracket onto the spar web there. Just because with the spar flange, I couldn't get the little clamp that we were using. It, it wouldn't fit over that flange. It's a little bit tall since it's got the two rows for the rivets there. So just using a little wood block to help clamp it in place after clicking the one hole that's in it to the spar web. Um, that worked out just great until I had match drilled enough holes to then be able to put in more clicos and not need the clamp and the wood block anymore. And then after that, for doing the different uh, like countersinking and everything, since it's an uneven piece, I just, once again, set it here. You can see between two different wood blocks to support it on either side to do the different um, countersinking that we needed to do for the rivets. This is a fairly short chapter in terms of page-wise. <laughs> it's deceptively short. There will be others like this in the rest of the build where it's like, oh, look, it's five pages. Technically, four pages, I guess, really, because the first page is just the, the diagram. Um, <laughs> but as I said earlier, this took several days to go through and actually do all of the drilling and countersinking on both flanges on both spars. <laughs> On to the final page there, 13-5 in step one, where it talks about cleaning the powder coating from inside the holes. I just put the little uh, aileron bell crank brackets that talked about just on like a little piece of wood and just 
uh, used it there to secure it while I ran the drill through. So it didn't, it's kind of a small piece. So just so it doesn't like whip around on you while you're trying to put a fairly large drill bit with a number 12 drill through there, you know, just holding it up against a, a piece of wood, it, it will help, uh, keep it from like spinning on you or anything while you're trying to put the drill through it. Yeah. And then that's it. So, um, it, again, it, <laughs> it's deceptively short, but this was a very, very long bit, quite a few days to do all of the drilling and countersinking. Again, this was my countersinking hell, <laughs> but no, it was really cool then here to have it, have it finished and be like, wow, okay. We got the first section of the wings done. Yay. All right, let's get to the giveaway part of our video. I have a set of anodized scrappy wing spar samples autographed by Mike Patey to give away. Thank you very much to Jonathan, one of my awesome patrons who donated this, and it seemed super appropriate to give away this set of the wing spar samples during the wing spar video. The contest is open to residents worldwide, and if you want to enter, be sure to like this video and then leave a comment down below letting me know what you are looking forward to seeing the most in an upcoming build video. So is it something in the wing kit? Is it something in the fuselage kit? I'm curious to see if there's a particular part of the build that y'all are most interested in learning about. If you're interested in becoming a patron and joining Tyler and I in our Discord chat where we share photos that we don't put up on Instagram, go to patreon.com slash plainlady and you can join for as little as $3 a month. But thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please be sure to give me a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe to my channel if you haven't already done so for more videos like these and to follow along as we build our RV tent.